Okay, we're going live. March 1st, 2017, meeting of the Council on Aging is now being called to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Francine, would you please take the roll? Please say here or present when I call your name. Commissioner Allen. Present. Chair Fotheringham. Here. Commissioner Gitt. Present. Commissioner Gorbach. Here. Commissioner Hagee. Here. Vice Chair Healy. Here. Commissioner Maria. Here. Commissioner Mortimer is absent. And Commissioner Norkin. Here. Thank you. Okay, this is the part of our program when we're open to public comments. We have two public comments today, the first of which is from Dina Frisling. We invite you to the podium. Thank you. First, I'd like to start out by thanking the Council on Aging for this opportunity to update uh, them and the community on the Canal Valley Village. Um, they were an instrumental in part of uh, this organization coming about. Um, they actually sponsored the feasibility study uh, and this was over two years ago so we've been working on it for more than two years now thank you we've been working on it for more than two years um, and uh, the feasibility study um, Nick Fotheringham and Nancy Healy and I worked on with other other folks and um, we're at a point now where the Council on Aging study has been f completely finished and the development is almost finished and we are targeting April this year, that is only a month away, towards opening um, Canal Valley, Valley Village, really launching it. Um, it is a nonprofit organization for you, you who are not familiar with it, and um, its purpose is to uh, help older citizens stay in their homes for as long as possible and to remain socially connected uh, to our community. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, and uh, it is, uh, has a uh, board of directors. The board of directors um, has been in place for a year. Um, and I'm, I'm the chair of that. And uh, in that capacity, asking you if you are interested in this, if you think this is something that you would like. Um, and maybe I should first say that, that um, you know, aging is, the positive aspects of aging is something that, that we're very aware of and want to emphasize in this and see this part of our lives as a time of, of continued growth and uh, learning when relationships are developed and maintained and when you have a feeling of control over aging. So all of that is very important. Um, this organization uh, is a portion of that, uh, can add to your lives in many ways. Um, and so we're asking you if you're interested. We're still doing recruiting, and we will continue doing recruiting. We are having a recruiting meeting March 13th, 3 to 5, over the Goble Foothill Lupine Center. I put some um, flyers out. If you're interested, please come. Uh, or we have a website, canalevalleyvillage.org. And our phone is 805-372-1826. Uh, we would very much like to talk to anyone who is interested and feel that this may be part of their process of uh, enjoying the, the years of aging. It adds um, services and events and so it has social components as well as, um, as really uh, practical kinds of things. So um, please contact us if you do have an interest and thank you for this opportunity for updating you. Hey, thank you. Our second public comment is from Nick Quidway. I begin in the name of God, who is most beneficial, most merciful. My name is Nick Iqbal Kidway, resident of Newberry Park since 1977 and director of Concerned Citizens of Thousand Oaks uh, since 1991. I thank uh, the commission for 
all the great work that you do and for allowing me to and others to speak and learn about the issues. I come officially now as a fellow senior citizen. I never thought, I, like so many people think, that I would get old and be one of them. And now I'm one of you. And uh, thank God that it is possible. I just uh, recently lost one of my best friends who was in good health and just passed away. And so uh, I really don't have anything shattering to speak about or really hot button issues to talk about like at yesterday's meeting uh, with the count city, of, city council. Uh, but I just s came to the meeting yesterday and saw the agenda and I thought maybe I should come in speak uh, since I'm one of the uh, of the club even though the club starts at age 50 <laughs> but 65 I believe is the official age and I'm one of those people that uh, when this building was built I was active and uh, when the Council on Aging first started I think I came to a few meetings I always watched them on TV and the replays etc because I worked during the day and uh, the thing that I feel upset about is that uh, I knew everybody at that time and over the years, a lot of the commissioners, but we have lost so many of them because of age, uh, because of the time. And uh, since I go to the council meetings and know some of the politicians and business people also, is people don't think about becoming a senior or, become, or dying and we just are so arrogant and if we have a Lexus and we live in on the lake that I mean who are you I mean I'm I'm everybody and this kind of thing and then uh, I have attended the funerals I have 33 size so I'm using my own timer <laughs> uh, I mean technology is so good now you don't need a uh, uh, a uh, Rolls Royce timer like the city council got for three thousand dollars, and you have to spend a lot of money to maintain <coughs> it. Is that uh, we should be just thankful to the Lord for what we have and uh, try to make a difference, like you com council members are doing. And I really appreciate uh, that you take time off of today and having so many people come over here during more than city council meetings. So maybe I might come back again. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Have a wonderful day. And thank you for making it clear that it's being old that's dangerous, not being on the Council on Aging. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now it's time for commissioner reports, and I'll turn the chair over to Vice Chair Healy. Our first report today will be our health report, and it will be delivered by Loretta. Thank you. Or Councilman to, Allen, which yes, have thank Council you, member. Councilman yes. Member Healy. Uh, okay, uh, today my uh, presentation is going to be on herpes zoster in the uh, in our population, the senior population, because it's much more dangerous in the senior population. I'll give you a few statistics. I'm not going to go through every line up there on the on the screen, but but it'll be available in the archives if you want to get all the details. But in our age group, most of us have experienced uh, chicken pox. Uh, not so true in the younger age group because of the chicken pox vaccine. But uh, the important thing is that that virus lives in the ends of our ganglion cells, in our nerve cells, and can reactivate uh, when we're older uh, and more at risk. And it's frequently associated with severe pain, rash, and since the topic today is on pain management, um, it, this is kind of timely. Uh, that it happens because the immunity in our cells decline as we age, especially um, if you go to the next screen, it'll, uh, I have some statistics that might be of interest because in the general population, about four adults a year uh, in a, a per thousand get shingles. I remember when my mom got shingles before she reached the senior, her senior years. However, when you get over 60, it's two and a half times that number. And they, it, it goes to 10 cases per thousand. 
and your lifetime uh, chance of getting zoster is about one in three. And those who make it to 85 have roughly a 50-50 chance of getting zoster. I know because my dad got it at 92. So, and it's very debilitating when you're over 80. Um, and if it goes up even more to 12%, if you've had cancer treatments or you're on steroids for rheumatoid arthritis or any kind of immunosuppressive or steroid type of medication, because that too decreases your um, uh, cell susceptibility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and as I mentioned before, today uh, they rarely, the pediatric residents rarely see any chicken pox because the vaccine has been available since 1995. However, the, you still are at risk of getting uh, shingles later on. So it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't negate the need for the uh, immunization as they age. The main thing is the, the common complications that get more severe in our age group. The nerve pain, uh, which persists after the rash leaves, leaves. and sometimes some people, I, being a nurse, I've taken care of uh, both inpatient, when we used to have them in an inpatient setting, and now mostly in an outpatient setting. It can last for years, and you do have to seek a lot of pain management uh, some people have to do that. The length of time increases as we age, and um, as I mentioned, it does require, uh, it can require pain management in a, our senior population. Uh, next slide, please. One of the uh, complications, the issues that seniors face, or anybody who, who gets a severe case of it, is in the eye. And that can be very painful, and you can also, because of the itching and the rash, you can get a bacterial super infection and palsies, nerve palsies if, uh, can, ha can occur. And you can also get like pyrolitis, uh, God, I can't even talk anymore, um, inflammation of the lining of the lung <laughs> or even in the brain. Uh, and in my readings, um, uh, I was doing a CME uh, thing for education. You can, stroke and heart attack have also been associated with zoster uh, in seniors. And mainly, it can just decrease your ability to enjoy life. So, uh, but there is something, what I'm trying to say, the goal of the Healthy Patients 2020 project is to get people vaccinated at a higher rate. So I know um, I've been vaccinated because my physician recommended it because the vaccination has been available to us since 2006. And if any of you watch TV late at night, the pharmaceutical company that makes one of the vaccines uh, advertises a lot. And it's a very moving ad. So um, you, it doesn't guarantee that you won't get shingles, but you will likely have much less of a case of it, a lighter case, and it won't last as long or be as severe. So in closing, if, if your MD forgets to recommend it, ask about that as per your preventive um, medicine thought for the month. And there's a, I put a link if you want to know more about it and you're into reading details at the bottom of the presentation. It's from the Annenberg Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Our next presentation, Commissioner Purport, is going to be on fraud by Commissioner Ron Hagee. Next to me. Okay, uh, we've had a lot of frauds uh, and exposure to frauds, and we had uh, Deputy Tim here explaining a lot of the frauds uh, that are prevalent now in our area. What I have for you today is uh, something that's brand new, and uh, it may not be considered a fraud, but it certainly endangers our senior population. Imagine this scenario. You walk across the parking lot, you open the, your uh, car door, you get in the car, and you start the engine, you put the car in reverse, 
you look in your rear view mirror and you see a piece of paper stuck to the rear window. So you put the car in park, you get out of the car, you walk around the back, and somebody jumps in your car and drives away. This is a new form of carjacking. And it's been happening frequently. And guess what, ladies, your purse is probably still in the car. Now they've got the keys to your house, your checkbook, your phone, your credit cards. This is really uh, a very serious, uh, uh, maybe not called fraud, but it's a very serious thing that we need to be aware of. If you get in your car and you see something on the rear window, ignore it, drive away, and maybe after you get a couple of miles away, uh, then you may want to get out and, and see what, what, what it is. But uh, I wouldn't even do that. I'd wait till I got to my destination to check on it. So I just thought I'd get, give you some contemporaries, and, and our program is full today, so I'll save the, the latest of the other frauds for next week. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, another uh, report involving our safety is going to be given by Commissioner Tony Gitt. Tony? Thank you, Nancy. Um, as we age, the risk of falling is a big risk for senior citizens. Falls are the most common cause of injury-related visits to the emergency room for people over 65. And as we age, our bones get more brittle, our bones become easier to damage from falls, and the older we get, guess what, the longer it takes to heal. So, is your home safe from falling? Can we have the next slide, Francine, please? So, I want to talk first about your stairs. Are your stairs clutter-free? You know, if you're going upstairs, the first thing you normally do, or if you're not going upstairs, is you put something on the stairs that you have to take up. And it, if you don't uh, keep your stairs clutter-free, uh, that could be a problem. Do you have rubber treads on the stairs that don't have any carpet? Are your handrails secure, not wobbly and with easy, within easy reach? Are your stairs well lighted and are there light switches within easy reach at the top and the bottom of the stairs? Let's go to the next slide, please. Inside walkways, are the walkways and hallways clutter free? Are throw rugs anchored down? Are walkways and hallways well lighted with handy switches available and is the furniture in the walkways reasonably stable? In your kitchen, is there a step stool available to reach things that you put in the high places in the cabinets? Is your floor non-skid, especially by the sink? Next slide, please. In your bathrooms, is there a ground fault interrupter on the electrical outlet in the bathroom? Are there any grab bars in the tub and shower and near the toilet? Do you have a night light in the bathroom? Are there non-slip mats or treads in the bathtub or in the shower? If you fall and you don't have a telephone or an emergency alert device within easy reach, what are you going to do? There have been several cases where people have lain on their floors for days. And uh, so you need to think about having some kind of a device uh, handy. Uh, remember, broken bones or hips take a long time to heal in older citizens. Uh, take steps now to avoid the falls. Declutter, tie down items that might cause you to fall. Remember, the bone you save may be your own. So don't fall and stay safe. <coughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Tony. Uh, we'll now turn to the liaison reports. The first one uh, introduced by uh, Nancy for the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program. Uh, our senior volunteer pro Caneo senior volunteer program director Rick Tanaka could not be here today, and so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the program if you aren't familiar with it. It is located at the Global Center. They if you just walk up to that main desk. They'll tell you where to find Rick or to find the office. Uh, it is if you're thinking like I did when I retired, what am I going to do? I used to have a 10 hour a day job. Now I have nothing to do. So if you are thinking of what could I do that would be interesting and fun and challenging, if you go over and thank you, if you go over and talk to Rick and they will be able to find 
something that fits you perfectly. You get choices. They have so many opportunities, some very simple that you can do from home, some that you can do from the Canales, the, the adult center, some of them that you can go out to places. I became a long-term care ombudsman from through that, in which was the beginning of all everything, and a council on aging member. So if you have any interest in doing something outside, please go over and talk to them at the Canale Senior Volunteer Program. There are so many choices, and you're not obligated to accept anything. So it's a wonderful program. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next liaison report will be presented by Harry Norkin on the Goble Adult Community Center. Thank you. Um, since Patty or Mike can't be here, I'm going to fill in for them. And I'm going to report on the, uh, on the up, upcoming doings for this month at the Global Center. First off, on Friday, March 17th, from 9 to 10 a.m., there will be a St. Patty's Day breakfast. Follow the rainbow to the Global Cafe. Um, at the, and the tickets for the affair are $5 at the front desk. Then on Wednesday, March 22nd, <coughs> at 3.30, there will be a Meet Me at the Movies with featuring Sully. The, um, call 805-382-2741 for reservations. And then on Thursday, March 23rd, from 1.30 to 3 p.m., there will be a presentation on the four federal programs that about to be or new seniors should understand, given by Betty Berry, the senior advocate. And she will talk about Social Security, Medicare, Supplemental in Security in Income, and Medicaid. For reservations, please call 805 381 2744. And then the, there will be an ongoing income tax uh, assistance given by the RSVP volunteers. Uh, they will be uh, from Monday, January 30th to April 13th. And they'll be on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays and Thursdays. However, Wednesday only will be at the Newberry Park Library. And the other three days will be at the Caneo Creek um, com Community Building, which is across the street from the Global Center. There's no appointment needed. It's on a first come, first, come, first serve basis. And the hours will be from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. on those days. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Norkin. Um, now is the time for commissioner comments. Do we have any commissioners that'd like to make a comment today? Loretta. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that the Senior of the Year uh, activities are coming up soon. We have uh, nominations are open until April 1st. So if you know a senior that's done a lot of uh, volunteering and you'd like to recognize them, your organization that you might belong to or uh, as an individual, you can um, nominate them and it's all available on the website or you can call uh, Francine or email Francine. And uh, also, if you'd like to place an ad in our, our booklet, that's another way to support the activity. Uh, and donations are already appreciated because we do serve a very nice dinner. And if you'd like to attend, it's on um, June 8th. And we usually have about 180 people that come plus. So come join us um, and have a good time. And while we honor all of the people who have been nominated and then one special one. And it's a very difficult decision to make. Thank you. Hope to see you there. Okay. Thank you. Karen? Thank you very much. I just wanted to announce that I am going to be teaching a couple of writing classes at Conejo Valley Adult School beginning next week. I'll be doing a three-hour workshop on dialogue writing next Wednesday the 8th from 9 a.m. till noon. And then beginning on Monday, March 13th, I'll be teaching a four-week class on memoir writing. The memoir writing class has only three seats left in it as of last night, so I know we have a lot of writers out there in TV land in the audience, so if you are interested in either of these courses, please give a quick call when you have a chance over to Conejo Valley Adult School. Thank you. 
Right. Are there other commissioner comments? Yes, Nancy. <clears throat> Just to build a little bit on what Commissioner Gitt said, I personally know someone who had a fall recently in their home. Turned out it was a stroke. But because no one was aware that she should be somewhere at a different time, she actually was on the floor in her home from, we're not sure, three to five days. Um, it's very scary. I, I live alone. I know I don't think it could happen to me, but I'm seriously considering getting a medic alert. Type. There's millions of them, but some type of thing for myself. In the case that just happened, uh, the woman is going to survive, but after a long stay in rehab and hospitalization, uh, but she did have a dog with her and the dog did not make it because they the dehydration, I guess, is worse for dogs. So if you live by yourself and, and nobody keeps track of you, like your kids don't call every day, like mine don't, you know, think about think about it. I mean, sometimes it's it's a little bitty thing, but it could make the difference for you in feeling secure and your family in having secure feelings about you. Thank you. Okay, other comments? Okay, I have a, a personal experience to share that's related to uh, Commissioner Gitt's uh, presentation and the and Nancy's uh, comment and so forth. Uh, one of my uh, medical problems is a lack of uh, adequate balance uh, and I decided to try to do something about this recently and I got involved in some physical therapy. Um, there was one aspect of this therapy that I think did me a tremendous amount of good and it's not one that I hear very much about and that is some, uh, did some exercises that involved strengthening my ankles uh, and they were very simple things using a latex stretching band and so forth to provide a little resistance and then just moving my uh, foot in all four directions and so forth to strengthen the ankles. And the result is after just a few weeks of that and so forth, when I began to uh, to feel losing balance, I could feel my catching myself in my ankles. I could feel those muscles uh, reacting and so forth rather than my arms flailing, uh, which I think has been a lot more effective. So uh, um, even I know Medicare only allows about 16 sessions a year of physical therapy, uh, which most of us are dependent upon. Uh, this is something you can easily do at home and so forth. It's not uh, difficult to learn. It's not difficult to do. Uh, helps if you have a partner to hold the other end of the band, but you can tie it to something as well. So I just wanted to pass that along in case it's something that hadn't occurred to you. Um, and other, finally, any other comments? All right, I'd like to pass the floor to Vice Chair Healy, who will introduce our person who's going to introduce our speaker for today. <laughs> I am going to introduce now uh, Hamali Davis, Dave, who is from UCLA, and she is going to give us a, uh, an introduction to our guest speaker today, for also from UCLA Health. Thank you. My name is Himali Deve. I'm a patient liaison with the UCLA Health, and it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Harki Chahal. He has a, a, a long pedigree, but I'm going to give you a little, uh, a couple of uh, um, a synopsis of his education. Um, Dr. Chahal completed his medical degree from uh, India. And then he went on to complete surgical internship at Morristown Memorial Hospital. And he spent two years of surgery at USC Medical Center. He then switched to anesthesiology and completed his residency and subspecialty training in pain management at the Brigham and Women's in hospital in Boston. He is currently board certified in anesthesiology and pain medicine and practices at the UCLA Health at, in Thousand Oaks, which is just around the corner here. Welcome, Dr. Chahal. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for a nice introduction. Actually, the whole time that I was sitting here, I kept on thinking my mom needs to be here. And she just retired. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, she, she, just, she just retired. She's 60, she turned 65, and uh, she's been having some of the very same issues that I've been hearing for the last 15, 20 minutes. And she had the issue of uh, losing her balance, and where um, 
she was literally walking and she stepped on a small pebble and she thought she's going to lose her balance. She actually almost fell. So we did some uh, things for her to make her regain her balance. Which she didn't really go to physical therapy, but I recommended some home exercises and she's doing much better. Actually, one of them was yoga. Um, but uh, So I'm here to introduce the concept of pain management and pain clinic and what we do and what we offer. Pain management is a relatively uh, new specialty. If you go about 50, 60 years ago, there was really no pain uh, programs that existed out there. Um, so a lot of people still actually don't know what we do in the pain clinic since it's such a young specialty. Most people actually think all we do is prescribe narcotics. And so I do have a lot of people that show up uh, wanting pain meds and it's purely just because there's lack of understanding what we can do and what we offer. Pain is not necessarily a new thing, but it's just back in the day, like I trained in India, and honestly, like, you just tell people to live with pain. One, because people don't have insurance, there's lack of resources, there's no money, so you're like, okay, deal with it. And people don't have insurance, so everything is cash, out of pocket. So the only time you really seek help is when you really, really need it. And that's typically reserved for medical conditions. So uh, pain's not a new thing. People have been playing with uh, opium for a long, long time. And like three, 4,000 years before Christ, then people were uh, cultivating um, opium. And it used to be one of the biggest trades from uh, Egypt into Greece and Europe. And, but we were always reluctant to use it excessively until recently. Like now we're at a point where like no matter which government meeting you look at, there's always a discussion on opiate, uh, opiate, uh, opiate epidemic. And I mean, it's just literally gotten to the point like America is 5% of the world's population, but we're consuming 75 to 80% of the world's narcotic. 90% uh, of the Dilaudid that was produced in the world is consumed in the United States. So uh, that wasn't the case, but that's where we are now. Four people die every single day from prescription drug overdose. And the reason I'm starting with this is because this is what the community thinks pain management is, but this is not what it is. This is not what it used to be. This is what it became for the last 20 years. Um, two million Americans are dependent on prescription drugs. And uh, it all started basically after prescribing somebody pain medications after surgery or somebody's having pain, but it's a non-cancer pain. and there's a lot of uh, marketing that happened, which was all backed by big pharma companies, and I, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but there's a lot of data out there to support it. Um, and actually, it started with this gentleman. He's a really, really uh, nice uh, physician, Dr. Russell Portnoy. Um, he practices, I think, out of, uh, he used to practice out of Cornell, and in 1986, he published a paper uh, based on 38 patients, and that's really what pushed uh, narcotics in, uh, into the limelight. He followed patients for about five to six years. He said, oh, there's not really too much physical dependence or um, there's not much of a abuse potential. And next thing you know, like American Pain Society was formed. They said every patient was admitted to the hospital. We should be monitoring their pain uh, level. And it was a good thing because before that, patients were their pain was being neglected and the reason is pain is so subjective it's really hard to quantify if somebody's in pain like if somebody's in the hospital you look at their vital signs you're like okay your heart rate's normal your blood pressure is normal you shouldn't really be having any pain and that's that's what we do and but it is so subjective that the patient could still be in 10 out of 10 pain because it's what's perceived in the brain um but it was um, yeah, and then uh, this slide, all you really need to know is that if you look at it, that there are two graphs that are sliding up. It's hard to read, but it basically says that the more and more uh, prescri uh, prescription narcotics that were out in the community, there were more and more overdose deaths. And those were basically drug abuse, uh, drug overdose deaths from, say, people who are injecting OxyContin, which is not what a typical pain patient would do, but a lot of drugs ended up on the streets. And there was a linear correlation. This is the number of people um, who are dying from heroin versus cocaine versus prescription drugs. 
And back in the 90s, it used to be that cocaine and her prescription drugs were about the same. And at some point, it doubled and tripled. Uh, this is the number of people who are dying from suicides versus accidents versus prescription drugs. And prescription drugs, you can just tell, that just kept on going up and up and up. So we have a problem. The government recognized that, and they, fi they fined the co uh, company Purdue for mis misbranding and uh, wrongful marketing that OxyContin is not addictive. And various different projects were launched by the government. Cures were launched where we can see if pa patients are not double dipping and that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, we realized that narcotics are not the solution. Because 15 years ago, we thought that is it. We figured out how to help people. We can take care of their pain and they can live happily ever after. But narcotics are not the answer. Um, and then CDC released their guidelines last year basically telling primary care providers to not uh, openly give out narcotics because that's what used to happen before. And this is our um, attorney general. He sent out a letter to every single physician in the country basically telling them not to prescribe opiates unless it's absolutely necessary. And when we think it's absolutely necessary, we're typically thinking of um, cancer patients or sometimes chronic pain patients where there's really no other option. And he's even launched a website. It's called Turn the Tide where we're basically trying to uh, go away from prescription drugs. Um, but Oxy uh, Purdue realized that the sales are going down in America, so <laughs> their sales were down from $9 billion to $4.5 billion, I think. So instead of uh, focusing on the American market, now they're focusing on the global market. And all they do is they like go into different um, um, countries, they literally hand out super discounted rates on OxyContin and people start taking it. Even if you're not dependent on it, as in like you're abusing it, but you become physically dependent on it. You just cannot do anything without it if you're like dependent on it and you take it every single day. And that's when they start selling it. So um, yeah, they're saying they're just getting started. Uh, but uh, going on to like what typically happens when you see a pain patient, and sometimes uh, it's, it's kind of hard. There's not enough evidence to show what works and what doesn't work for pain management. And we still lack a lot of evidence. A lot of research needs to be done. But this is a typical pain patient, like say 62-year-old male. He's been having back pain on and off since his 30s, kind of like me. I'd probably be there because I'm already having back pain. And... Uh, and then about a year ago, his pain worsened. He went to his primary care doctor who gave him um, some ibuprofen, oxycodone, and sent him to physical therapy. Um, pain got better, but then over Christmas, he was like taking the lights down. He lifted something heavy, and then suddenly he felt like the pain was shooting down his leg. The primary care physician gave him a med medrol dose pack and sent him to the pain clinic. This is, and then when the patients show up in the pain clinic, by the time their quality of life suffer, suffer, they can't go out, they don't have a social life, they're constantly in pain, they can't sit for a long time or stand for a long time, they can't go for walks, they can't even sit and watch TV for too long because it's just uncomfortable to sit. So then your mood starts suffering. So uh, typically, like people, uh, patients who've been in pain for a long time, they'll um, start getting some signs of depression. So pain's one of the most prevalent diseases, way more than diabetes, cardiovascular conditions, cancer, everything combined. 20% uh, of the adults worldwide at any given point are suffering from pain. And it's one of the most common uh, causes of uh, work hours that I've lost. 70 to $100 billion that we lose. Um, and when somebody's in chronic pain, you start losing your gray matter in the brain. Uh, within a year, if you've been in chronic pain, you lose about 5% of your uh, cortical gray matter, which would normally take about 10 years to lose, 5 to 10 years. So it's, uh, to control pain is important, but the question is how do, how do we do it? Now if somebody gets a surgery done or somebody has an accident and then they have pain, that's easy. Um, that's easily controlled and most of the time it gets better. The problem is when, say, you get an injury and then, or you get a surgery done, somebody gets a hernia surgery done, and then three months later, they're still having pain. That's a problem. So chronic pain, when somebody's having pain for more than three months, most commonly is from back pain, low back pain, and then some neck pain. Arthritis is one of the 
biggest culprits, knee pain from arthritis, hips hurt from arthritis, and then headaches is like the third largest one. Uh, fibromyalgia is up there, and uh, just like Commissioner Loretta Allen was talking, shingles is up there, especially in the older population. And then when somebody's had diabetes for a long time, they can have peripheral neuropathy, and that's up there. And patients will typically say their feet burn all day and all night, and they can't even sleep. Low back pain is one of the commonest ones, and it's typically anytime you have pain between like the gluteal folds and the costal margin where your ribs end, that's basically your low back. So anywhere in there, if you have pain, that's low back. Most of the people will have low back pain at some point in their life, but the good thing is it goes away by itself. 90% of the people will get better by themselves. Um, and, but, and the problem is most of the times we don't even know what's wrong. And yes, you can have MRI findings, but it may or may not mean that's what's causing the pain. Like at any given point, like right now, if we were to walk out and run an MRI scan on 100 first people that we see, 80% of them will have some findings on the MRI. But the people who have pain versus the people um, who actually have the worst MRI findings, they may be completely different. People who have pain may have barely anything on the MRI. Some people may have the worst looking MRI and won't have any pain. Like one of my colleagues, she is 62, she's run 26 marathons, and uh, she's having some pain now, so I looked at her MRI, her MRI is the worst MRI I've ever seen. She still does Pilates, she still like goes out, runs, hikes, and she's so active. And But then I see patients in the clinic, and their MRI doesn't look bad at all, but they're in pain. The And the reason is, um, it's just the way our nerves are wi wired. It's just a disease of the nervous system. It's really hard to quantify, and it's definitely really hard to pick it up uh, on imaging. Aging is one of the commonest causes uh, of low back pain. And we don't realize how early our spine starts to degenerate. Like before you get any gray hair, any wrinkles, anything like in the 20s when you don't even think about it when you think you're invincible that you can do anything and you will never destruct yourself that's when it starts like i think of myself when i was in the gym the way i would lift the weights and now like in my 30s i can already tell the difference what i did to myself but by the age of 23 you can already see signs of degeneration in the lower two lumbar levels in the spine and by the age of 20, 28, if, you, if somebody were to do an autopsy, 75% um, of the 28-year-olds will have degeneration of the low back. You won't necessarily pick it up on an X-ray or MRI, but you will see it. But by the time you're 35, you can pick up something or something else, like at least some signs in 40% of the patients by the age of 35. And the reason is just the way the design is that the discs don't get any blood supply of themselves. They literally just leach off the blood supply from the bones, from the vertebrae. And then as we get older, uh, I don't know if people have heard the term sarcopenia. By the time you're 30, 35, you start losing your muscle. And that's why you never really see athletes who are that far into like 30, 35, 40 years old. That's why it's such a big deal because no matter how hard you try, you, it's hard to build muscle. Your body just naturally starts losing muscle. So you have to be really active to retain that muscle. So just because of sarcopenia, the muscles start weakening. You start looking from a very good posture to like a really bad posture for your low back. But that's so typical. And, and the, goal is, like, the goal is to avoid that. The goal is to stay active and use your muscles as much as possible. Now, if you were to look at that picture, the first thing you see is how like the entire upper body is supported by the low back. That's if you don't have good muscle tone, which a lot of people don't because people don't focus on their health. People, like even if they do, they don't focus on their core. The way it's supposed to be is like this. Now, if you were to look at that picture, you barely see the spine. All you see is muscles. That's all those muscles, if they're engaged, you don't have that much pressure on your spine. You can easily offload your spine and take care of yourself. That's why my 60-year-old friend who's run 26 marathon, whose MRI looks horrible, that's why she's able to do everything she can because her muscles are in amazing shape. She takes care of them. So this is how the spine looks 
on the top you can see what a n normal disk looks like it's nice it's plump you can't necessarily see on the uh, on the picture here but on MRI that would look nice and white because it's rich in water and it's hydrated then it starts uh, degenerating you can see and then you can see at some point it starts bulging a little bit when the bulge gets bigger the gel from the middle of the disc leaks out more and more that's when we call the disc as herniating and then it starts thinning out more and more and at the bottom you can see there's like the bony formations on the vertebra that's what we call osteophytes it's just like what would happen to your knees when you go to a surgeon and they say you have a lot of osteophytes or bony spur bone growths in your knee that's exactly what happens to the spine and if you look at from a different angle you can see that in the middle the light blue area is where the gel is that gives the cushioning to the spine and then the around it the darker blue is where the fibers are that retain the gel in the middle now those fibers start cracking and drying and when they crack too much uh, that's when the gel can leak out and the problem is once you get a crack in the uh, outside area that crack always stays you can stay healthy you can do physical therapy like get your muscles stronger it would offload the spine but once you get a disc prolapse you're always at a risk for another disc prolapse at some point in your life um do, do i have a timer here somewhere i'm sorry i had it on my phone okay 16 minutes so uh, here you can see uh again like in a different picture how like if you first you have a very small degeneration and then it gets bigger and then bigger and if you don't do anything eventually a small part of a disc can actually leak out and just what we call sequestration and once you have that it cannot get resorbed by itself because it now it's lost contact to the original disc that has to be surgically taken out so once you start getting symptoms early on you have to do something about it now like i was saying earlier pain is really really complex two people with the same findings on the MRI will have very different amounts of pain and um, one of my uh, grandmothers my mom's mom she's 92 I believe she fell uh, one of somebody was saying the story here right yeah something very similar she she lives in England but she likes to go back to India she was visiting and uh, during the day she would get some help they would come and help her with food and stuff at night she's by herself she fell at some point I don't know why she was she thought she would do it she put up a ladder next to um, something and then she was trying to do something and she fell from the ladder broke her back lay there all night and some point in the morning somebody thought hey you know what why is our light still on and so somebody jumped the wall they went and they found her fallen and they but it's India again nobody does anything they're like are you okay she's like oh yeah I'm okay I can't really stand up straight right and fast forward five years, she still can't stand up straight, and I hadn't seen her for the longest time, and when I saw her, she's literally like this, and she can't stand up straight at all. And that's probably because uh, nobody's done anything about it because she probably crushed half of the vertebrae in her spine. So she has so many compression fractures in her spine, I can just see looking at her posture. She can't even stand up without support, but she has no pain. Yeah, right? I was like, how do you have pain? How do you not have any pain? She's like, I'm okay. She'll get up in the morning, she'll pray, and every meal she eats, she has to cook for it f herself. She li lives with my uncle, so she has people at home that can help. She's like, no, I'm gonna cook my own meals, and I'm gonna take care of myself. No pain, impossible. I, I wanna study her, actually. I was like, how is that possible? My father, he unfortunately passed away from prostate cancer. The first time he was diagnosed, he hated doctors, actually, is the irony of the situation that his brother, my uncle, he's a vascular surgeon, his son is a doctor, both his nephews are doctors, he hates doctors. <laughs> he thinks that doctors are all out there to get you, that, yeah, I, I don't get it. So we could tell that there's something wrong with him. He wouldn't let us uh, go to the hospitals. At some point, we dragged him, we took him in, we found out that he has stage four prostate cancer. Like, it was unfortunate. But when they uh, did all the imaging and everything, he had God knows how many fractures. He had so many fractures in the body and some of the fractures were already fused by themselves because they've been fractured for so long. There was healing going on. Some of them were like malunited because they were at an angle and they weren't bones weren't properly lined up. 
the guy never complained of pain. Is it, how is it possible that he didn't have pain? He, of course, did. He just thought, I'm not going to go to the doctor. I'm just going to live through. That's not the right answer either, but it says a lot about the mindset. So pain is very complex. So a lot of times I'll see patients and they'll be in so much pain that I'm sitting there, I was like, God, I honestly, I really don't have an answer for you. The problem is 50, 60, 70% of the times we don't even know what's causing the pain, but it's there. Sometimes it's easy. You're like, okay, you have this and this injury or um, sometimes if somebody has a, a condition called complex region pain syndrome, we can easily say, oh yeah, I see symptoms in your hand or arm or leg and that's why you have pain. But a lot of times we don't. And this is what it comes down to. Some people, they just have some aspect in their life that they don't realize that they're not happy about. It could be something as simple as that. You may not be happy at your job. You may not be happy in your personal life, uh, in your relationships. You don't realize, but that like aggravates your pain so much more. It like quadruples it 10 times just because mentally you're not happy. And you don't, sometimes you don't even know that. And the problem is if, and the worst is if somebody actually has some anxiety or depression on top of that, then the problem is if you don't control the mood, the pain will never get better. But if you don't control the pain, then their social life is lost and their mood will never get better. So the both of them actually has, have to be handled hand in hand. And it's, it's such a difficult thing to control. So pain is very complicated. And, and the worst is the more you think about it, the worse it gets. The more you ignore it, the, the better it gets. And it's not to say that just like ignore it and live on with it, but um, there's a little component to like just push through. But if it's hard, you just can, you're functionally limited, then you should always seek help. And there's a lot of stuff that can be done about it. But say you go to a doctor, typically like say if you have low back pain, um, we'll just take low back for an example. They'll order x-rays, and you can see that x-rays, you can't really see much other than bones. So all you can really tell is, oh, okay, there's fracture, there's no fracture, or there's some arthritis, there's no arthritis. So if somebody has pain that shoots into the legs, or uh, you want to look at the spine sl somewhat better, then you order an MRI. If it's indicated, we can see things better, especially the disc and the condition of the disc, and if the nerves are getting compressed. And then like sometimes if somebody has diabetes on top of that or some other vascular condition that can cause peripheral neuropathy, then somebody can order uh, nerve conduction studies. The idea is we want to delineate what exactly is going on, what's causing the pain. Once we do that, then typically uh, what we try to do is manage it conservatively. Do some medication, uh, medication, do physical therapy, and hopefully that helps. The problem is there's no one thing that helps completely. Everything kind of like take 20, 30% of the pain away. And there's literally nothing that would completely take it away or cure it. It's just one of those things um, that you essentially have for the rest of your life. Just like say you have hypertension or diabetes. Once you have diabetes, you know you essentially have it for the rest of your life. You just have to manage it well, just like blood pressure. So, uh, so what we do is we try medications uh, typically, the anti-inflammatories work really well, like Tylenol, ibuprofen. We'll try some muscle relaxants, sometimes antidepressants, because you want to m make sure the mood is good. Now, the problem is opiates, narcotics used to be used pretty frequently, and now we know that that's questionable whether we should be using them or not. Now, where pain clinic comes in is, like, say, if you've tried everything, now you're not getting better, Typically, it used to be, oh, okay, you're not getting better. Your next option is surgery. Um, say you have knee pain, knee arthritis. Okay, you tried medications. It's not helping. Next option, get a knee replacement. Now we know that we can do injections. We can do steroids into the knee. We can inject some substances that, that are like gel that can buy you a few years. And now the technology is changing so fast. There's reports coming out of Australia where they're injecting stem cells and uh, they literally do a liposuction. So you get a liposuction out of it, and they <laughs> get your stem cells out of it, yeah? And then they say injecting into your knees. Now you're a skinnier you with a better knee. Uh, yeah, life is good. So sometimes you just want to buy a few years, and you never know what the technology is going to be like in five years. And <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> 
Yes, yeah, so it's something like stem cell center in Australia. I don't remember the name of it, but the data is really good so far. I mean, athletes have been doing it for a few years. Uh, Kobe did it for his Achilles, and a bunch of other athletes have done it. Yeah, the problem is insurance always lags behind. Um, like our textbooks typically lag, data lags behind five years, textbooks lag behind 10 years, insurance lags behind 15, 20 years. <laughs> so <laughs> so n the problem is like right now um, it's all cash and there's not a lot of people offering it because it's really hard to offer something when you don't have the data to support it. I, how do you tell somebody that spent $10,000 but it may or may not help you? If you're an athlete or if you have a lot of money, then it doesn't matter. I would try it in a heartbeat before getting a surgery but not everybody wants to do that. But the idea is there's a lot of options before you get a surgery and after you fail the medications. Um, there's a lot of uh, data to support alternative therapies and uh, so we send a lot of patients for um, psychotherapy because we want to make sure um, if there's any negative thoughts that are holding you back, that are making your pain worse, we want to make sure you sort through them and you uh, get positive reinforcement uh, in your mind. We do cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, we have a, a East-West Center at UCLA where we do acupuncture. Now the data on acupuncture is questionable uh, for long-term benefit, but for, for short-term benefit it's pretty good. Chiropractor, yoga, like for me, I feel like try everything. Do anything that works. Um, um, you never know. Sometimes all you need is a couple of adjustments here and there, and that'll be it. But uh, there was a study that came out literally uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was published in Annals of Internal Medicine, very reputable journal. And I'll skip through the slides that are busy, but the gist of it is if somebody has acute pain, like say you hurt your back or something like that, you have a sprain in the back, all you really need to do is do some Motrin, a leave, and do some muscle relaxants and if you need to do some physical therapy, and that'll be it. You shouldn't really need to do any more than that. At least the data doesn't support anything else. Now, if the pain has been existing for more than three months, um, then it's, uh, and if it's just back pain, it doesn't go into the legs, then again, b the most amount of data is for a leave, or like any anti-inflammatories, or Motrin, or any, any, any of those. Yoga has a lot of benefit that's been shown. That being said, I've told a lot of people to do yoga, and sometimes they come back to me saying they made it worse. <laughs> so, so you have to be careful. Don't push, your, push yourself too hard, because a lot of times, say, you're trying to do a stretch, and your fascia is not fully stretched, or your muscles are not fully stretched. Now, some of the movement is going to come from the joints, and you don't want to do that. Like, say, you're like, I see a lot of people that are trying to touch their toes, and they can't do it because their hamstrings are really tight, so they can't get the tilt from the pelvis to do it. So what they do is they really arc their back, and th that puts a lot of pressure on the uh, disc. So you have to be careful what you do, but there's still a lot of benefit for yoga. And just being active, just exercise, walk around, do s some weight training, some stretching. The problem is, like, you have to do a lot. Like, I remember, like, when I told my mom she was losing a balance, I was like, hey, you know what? This is what I want you to do. I got her one of those BOSU balls. It's like the half ball. So I was like, when you watch TV, stand on this for 10 minutes. Just like 10 minutes every day. And her balance got so much better. Then I was like, okay, now you're better. Now you can go to a yoga class. She started doing a yoga class. And now, like, a year later, she can stand on one leg and do a tree pose. She couldn't do it at the age of 60, but now she can do it at the age of 65. So... Sometimes it doesn't take a lot. It's just like very small. It, there was actually a study that came out of Harvard. Um, they looked at people who were 65. They had never done any exercise. Typical, just like my mom. She's like, I've never been in the gym. What are the chances I'm going to go to the gym at 65? They divided them into people who actually started exercising at the age of 65 and then people who just lived the life that they've been living. They looked them at 75. People who actually started doing activity and going to the gym and training at 65, their functionality was like 10 times more than people who didn't do anything. So you actually add years to your life, and more than that, you add functionality to your life. You can do a lot more rather than just like having to sit all day because you can't do anything. So it's never too late. Um, so exercise, there's a lot of benefit. Now, the problem is when you have back pain, but it shoots into the legs. When you have what people commonly refer to as sciatica, that's where we have trouble. 
that's where like none of the medications work. Now, typically when you come to us, we'll give you something called a gabapentin or Lyrica. Most of you have seen ads on TV. And the reason for that is like, is it efficacious to control the radicular pain that's shooting into the legs? Probably not. But the reason we do that is, once you start having pain that's in the nervous system, then after that, there's after a, like a year or so, there's something maybe sooner, there's a phenomenon we commonly refer to as a wind-up phenomenon. What happens is your nerves get aggravated. And it doesn't happen in everybody, but over time, it can happen in a lot of people. So now, even if your pain is okay, you will feel... Uh, a higher pain response just because now your nerves are just automatically triggering pain in your spine and then your brain starts perceiving uh, more and more pain even though you're not having that much pain so that's within your brain gets something what we call central central sensitization so to calm that nervous system down so we put patients on gabapentin now the data so far doesn't support it but that's the reasoning behind it and uh, Sometimes uh, the studies, I, we need to do a lot more study to figure out what exactly the benefit is, but that's the idea. You don't want that to happen, so, um, so if you have pain that shoots into the leg, definitely seek help. Now, some people say, okay, uh, I'm in so much pain, the ba all I want to do is just sit, because anything else I cannot do. That's the worst you can do for yourself. The reason being, your bone density is going to decrease 2% per week. And typically, older patients are already going to have osteoporosis. You can just imagine within like a couple of months what you can do to yourself. And then you, um, and once you lose that bone mass, it's so hard to gain it back. It's almost impossible to gain it back. And then your muscle strength will literally go down 10% per week. So you got to stay moving. Uh, again, when you come to us, our goal is to improve functionality. Pain may or may not get better. But the goal always is to, to be able to do more. Like if somebody uh, comes to me, they're like, hey, you know what? I'm in 10 out of 10 pain. Just help me with that. To me, if your brain is perceiving 10 out of 10 pain now, and yes, your pain may get better, but more important to me is that you're able to play with your grandkids, even if you're still having 10 out of 10 pain now. But that's more important because the brain is so subjective. Sometimes it's really hard to control how the brain perceives it. Functionality is much more easy to quantify. And so that's what we go for. Uh, so this is the study I was talking about. So going back to the case that I was referring to, so the couple of things that were done wrong in that is, like what we wouldn't do now is, one, we wouldn't have given the patient oxycodone that was given to that patient when he first went to the doc primary care doctor. But that's what's been done. And part of it is because the government's kind of driving it. It was, at least. Because there was the, I don't know if you guys have heard, there was that whole push ho that the doctors and the hospitals should be paid based on the patient satisfaction. So what the, uh, what the doctors would do is, especially their emergency rooms, they would make candy bags, which is essentially like you have narcotics. And patients would leave happy because they got narcotics. And that's the worst thing you can do. But if you don't do it, then the patients are unhappy, and then they give you bad ratings, and, the and then you get less payments. So if I can really drive one point across is that's basically narcotics is not the answer. It's just it's the worst thing you can do for yourself, like unless somebody has cancer pain. Steroids, a lot of uh, physicians actually give us steroid packs, and patients feel great. And that's because steroids can make you feel better no matter <laughs> what you're going through. You just feel like this steroid psychosis. You just, like, it just makes you feel good. And it will decrease inflammation, so there's some benefit to it, but uh, there's no long-term efficacy. And especially in older population, if somebody has diabetes, hypertension, it will make all of those worse. Now, if you come to the pain clinic, and there's honestly nothing I can do, that can change the um, disease process. Like if somebody has arthritis in the spine, they have arthritis in the spine, there's nothing I can do to stop it or slow it. The only person that can help is you yourself by being active. You gotta get those muscles stronger. Like if you go back to the picture where I showed, there's your core muscles, your spine muscles, everything has to be strong. Same thing if you have arth knee arthritis, you gotta get those thigh muscles strong. 
that's the only thing that's going to slow down because you got to offload those joints. You got to take the pressure off the joints and put the pressure into the muscles. What I can do is I can help you get there because if you have a lot of pain, you won't be able to do it. And so what we do is we'll do injections. Um, so you have knee pain, we'll inject the knee. You have back pain, we'll inject the back. And the idea is that you go home, you work with physical therapy for say nine or 16 sessions, whatever Medicare approves. And after that, you keep on doing what you did with uh, the physical therapist. That's the only thing that's gonna make a difference. But there's a lot of stuff we can do that can keep you from getting a surgery. Especially when you get a spine surgery, the outcomes are only 50%. Like if you have advanced arthritis in the knees, you get a knee replacement, the outcomes are actually really, really good. But if you get a spine surgery, the outcomes are only 50%. So that's something we really try to avoid. Now that being said, if you need a surgery, you should always get it. And But a clinician, sh we should know when to refer a patient to surgery. If somebody has persistent weakness in the leg, I can't just keep on doing injections and doing physical therapy because that person's gonna lose the strength in the leg. So that person should go to surgery early so they can retain the strength. So there are indications for everything. But for vast majority of the patients, the goal is physical therapy, exercise, strength, and if you're really hurting so much that you can't do it, then you come to us and we can do injections and make you feel better. And there's so many things. Like you can have one knee that hurts, that's gonna make you put pressure more on the other knee and suddenly now you have an imbalance in the pelvis. So your SI joints, the sacroiliac joints can get inflamed. And next thing you know, your spine is a little um, uh, twisted. And now you have more pressure on one side of the spinal uh, um, joints, the facet joints. So you can get arthritis of that. And this doesn't happen overnight. And sometimes like you can, your knee has been hurting on and off for like say 10 years and you don't even realize. Or like the commonest thing I see is when people, the ladies carry their purse, they carry on one shoulder. They always carry it like this. And it's just like, and again, like most of the times, like I just look at my, like I just, the first thing is like my mom, I was like, do not carry your purse just on the right shoulder. Either strap it across or switch shoulders, you have to. And because you do it for 10 years, for now after 10 years, your left side of the spine joints have been squished a lot more than the right side. And it's your, and your posture is all worse. So uh, there's a lot of, and nothing happens overnight. It all happens over like our lifetime. We acc accrue all these um, uh, things that we do in our body. And then by the time we're 60, 70, that's when you start getting the symptoms. So uh, if you have any postural issues, fix that. If you need orthotics in the shoes, do that. All the basic stuff. And, but really to slow the progress of the disease and arthritis, like say if you're 60, to be more functional when you're 70 and 80 and 90, you really have to slow down that arthritis and the degeneration. And the only way you can do that is like getting the muscles stronger and just being more active. Uh, once again, if you can't do it, come see us. There's a lot of stuff we can do and everything is uh, through a needle. Uh, so there's no surgery, there's no cutting. And uh, unless it's absolutely indicated, then we'll send you to a surgeon. So again, like this is just to show like how we do it. We can target any part of the spine. And this is just a photo for the spine, but it's again for anything. If you have headaches, if your muscles are too tight, we can inject Botox in the muscles, local anesthetics, and uh, for the knee, for the shoulder, almost anything can be injected. And it's all done through a needle. And uh, so yeah, th that's how we do it. When you come, you lay down, that's for the spine. <coughs> Everything is done with the help of an x-ray, so we know exactly uh, where the needle's going. So we uh, make sure we're at the right target. And uh, again, at the end of the day, it all comes back to you just being active. Uh, any questions? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, we'd like to thank you for this very informative talk today. I'm sure we welcome. all got a lot out of it. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, I'd like to ask if there are any questions from the commissioners. Tony. So um, one of the most painful things I've been through is a cracked rib. 
and uh, the doctors say there's nothing you can do. Of course, they can give you opioids or something else. Um, is there anything that you can do, or is just aspirin even a, a consideration? So, uh, yeah, broken rib probably is the worst thing that can happen. And uh, was it the uh, Green Bay Packers player, Corey Jabin? Corey Jabin? Yeah, he played with broken ribs two weeks later. It probably is the worst thing. Uh, yeah, it's one of the most painful things, and, and he's your surgeon's right. There's not much you can do about it. Uh, what we can do is, the whole idea is to have pain relief while the rib heals. So the easiest thing is taking anti-inflammatories, say Motrin, Aleve. Now, some people would say when you have a bony injury like that, a fracture, you shouldn't take anti-inflammatories because, because it impairs bone healing. But then the data is very equivocal. Like, a lot of times, like say for brain surgeries, we do a lot of high-dose steroids to decrease the swelling in the brain, but then when we put the bone flap back on, it heals perfectly fine. So the data is very equivocal. If you talk to orthopedic surgeons, though, they will say, no, don't use anti-inflammatories. I think it's okay. And from, but if you come to the pain clinic, if it's so bad that you can't do much, then we can do something called intercostal nerve blocks, where we basically uh, take local anesthetic and steroids and injecting in, in the uh, intercost where the nerves run. Um, the local anesthetic doesn't really help for that long. The steroids decrease inflammation in the nerves a little bit. Um, we can, um, if it's really that bad, then we can sometimes even inject, uh, insert catheters and give a pump for local, uh, that injects local anesthesia and we can keep that in for a few weeks. But, uh, yeah, so a couple of different things we can do depending on how bad it is. Excuse me. All right. And sometimes if you have a trauma and you're in the hospital and uh, the pain gets better within a few days, very quick. Say if you're in, admitted in the hospital, we can also uh, do something called an epidural catheter, which is similar to what you do for pregnant patients when they're delivering, so depending how many ribs are involved. Yeah. Ron? I was wondering, uh, you seem to uh, tout uh, exercise as being one of the best things you could possibly do. I truly believe in that, yeah. What about walking as exercise? Uh, uh, I think walking's great. But uh, it has to be where you're getting cardiovascular benefits. Like if you're walking really slow, again, something's better than nothing, but you get the benefits for the heart. If you're walking at a moderate pace where you, can, you break a sweat and you feel your heart rate go up, then that's where you really need to be. Nick, Karen? Thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, can you talk just for a couple more minutes about arthritis, which is so common among so many folks, mm -hmm. and as I understand, that is often when the cartilage has yes. worn down between the joints and and all the um, the commercials for thing for remedies they say are going to build your cartilage. Is that a bunch of pooey? And then secondly, what, what is it that you inject? And what, what, is that, what does that do, like jelly or something? What do you do? So there's like maybe nine or different products at the moment, which are all uh, synthetic products that you can inject. Again, the idea is they're gel-like, they're viscous, and then you inject them into, say, the hip joint or the knee joint or the ankle joint. And the idea is that you provide, um, you decrease the friction since the cartilage has worn out. But surprisingly, some people don't respond that well to them. Like say, my mother, say, uh, say for example, her, her knees are really bad. She got that uh, uh, viscous stuff injected and she felt no benefit. But then she got steroid injected, she felt much better. Now that doesn't make any sense if you think of it from, from a mechanical standpoint because you have arthritis, cartilage is worn out, you inject this viscous stuff, it should feel so much better versus injecting, say, a steroid in it. But I think her um, arthritis is not to the point where her cartilage has worn out so much and th she had more inflammatory pain than like say bone on bone pain. So she felt better with steroids. Now, well I shouldn't say bone on bone because once you're that far you, should, you essentially need a surgery. Now, there's like nine different brands that are available out there, maybe 10, and all of them have different molecular size, and some say one works better than the other, but they all are kind of the same. And each insurance covers like a different one, but they're all the same. The idea is you want to inject them, and then you fill up the space so you decrease the friction. Now for the future, like I was saying uh, earlier, there's the whole idea about 
regenerating the cartilage. And the idea is that if your bonehead is completely normal, you have this tiny layer of cartilage that's worn out, why can't we just replace the cartilage? Why can't we grow it since we can grow like almost every other organ in the body? So they are using stem cells uh, to inject there and then um, the idea is that the cartilage grows. Um, like uh, from um, molecular level, I don't know exactly how that works. Like if you inject stem cells, like a pluripotent stem cell, like what triggers them to say differentiate into cartilage? I don't know. But the, so far they say uh, the results are very promising. That if you have mild to moderate arthritis, you can put uh, like you can put away a knee replacement or a hip replacement for at least five to ten years. But which is amazing because say you had a knee replacement 20 years ago, the knee would have lasted 10 years, and then you need another one because the, pro like the implants weren't as good. But now the implants are so good that they can last 20 years. You give it another 10 years, maybe you won't need any replacement. If you do need it, you'll only get one, and you'll be done forever. So you're welcome. Harry, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, what about topical applications like... Um, an aspirin salve to a, a, a rub on knee that are arthritic and osteo, osteoarthritis. Uh, I personally uh, prefer the topicals more than systemics, if it's uh, possible. Like say, if somebody has pain in the ribs, the ribs are very close to the skin, and you can get the topical uh, into that area easily. It, say, if somebody has postherpetic neuralgia shingles, that's easily covered by a topical. Knees, again, they're closed. You can easily cover them with topical. But if somebody has back pain, now the, the spine is like this much deeper than the skin um, where the actual joints are in the spine. So that part is hard to cover. I'm talking about knee pain. Yeah, it's perfect. I would prefer topicals over like say taking pills systemically. I personally don't like it, taking any pills if I can avoid it. Because I think everybody, everything has side effects. Like especially if somebody has arthritis, it's not like you're gonna take Motrin or Leaf for a week and then stop taking it. Say you start taking it at the age of 65, 70, you're gonna have to take it for a decade, two decades, for as long as you live. And almost everybody's gonna ha has some kind of heart problems, if not heart problems, you have some kidney problems, everybody has gastritis or heartburn, and then it becomes so hard to take anti-inflammatories uh, th but that's a really the only thing that helps with arthritis to decrease the inflammation and help with the pain. So it becomes very tricky. And that's kind of like where I come in as well because if you can't tolerate any of those, then we we'll kind of have to inject all those places so you don't need get a surgery. Yeah. Thank you. Other You're questions? Welcome. Yes. Laura? Uh, yeah. My uh, young hairdresser <laughs> <laughs> has that back problem that uh, 20s in her 20s and 30s she's been getting what they call a burning of the nerve yes is this some new technique or something so so if somebody is that young well she's in her mid 30s yeah so she's had them for a long time th so the idea is like when you look at the spine between each vertebra you have these these joints a facet joints it's just like any other joint in the body um just it's a synovial joint just like our knee joints there's a small branch of nerve that comes and supplies those joints. And all the, the function of the nerve is just to provide the sensation to the joint. Now what we do is we put local anesthesia at those joints, we numb them up, see if the patient feels better, if they feel better, and then we bring them back and we burn that nerve. The idea is you just take the sensation away. You're doing nothing to the pathology underneath. Y the patient feels better for about a year. After a year, the nerve it takes about a year for the nerve to regrow, and they reattach around the burn, and then you start getting the pain again. Uh, what I is there a benefit to that? Yes, but the benefit is only if you do that and you use that year, one year that you have of pain-free, to get your muscles stronger. Because if you're 30. Like, are you honestly gonna get that every single year for the rest of your life? It's not gonna work, it's not sustainable. Um, so like, I'm 30, I got back pain every single day because I was lifting too heavy in the gym and I have four bulging discs now. I know I have a problem, so if I don't, if I don't stop what I'm doing, that's wrong. I mean, it's just a matter of time before I need a surgery or if I'm in the campaign clinic myself. 
So you really have to address what the root of the problem is. So if she's 30, and she has that problem, yes, that's gonna help her, but she should really like simultaneously start being active. Yeah. All right, let's adjourn the meeting. Okay, thank you everybody. Okay, I'll stick around, yeah. Mm -hmm.